Hello YouTube and welcome to an all new Elder Scrolls lore video. Today we have a short video talking about the Dragonstone from Bleak Frost Barrow, what it actually was. Because it's one of the first pieces of the past that people actually come into contact with while playing Skyrim. That said, this won't be a long video but definitely an interesting one, so let's immediately start. So most of the Nordic ruins that we find in Skyrim were either ancient cities of the ancient Nords or they were tombs built by the ancient Nords. Specifically most of the ruins that we find in Skyrim were built by the dragon cult, the ancient Nords following the old Nordic pantheon which did not exactly worship gods but worshipped animals. This belief originated on the continent of Edmora which is the original home continent of the Needs, which is a race of humans that is an ancestor to the Nords and ancestor to the, to the Imperials and the Bretons, basically all the light-skinned humans on Tamriel. Anyway, on the continent of Edmora they worshipped animals, and the original Edmorans saw the dragons as chief among the animals. Dragons, having domination in their nature, saw themselves worthy of worship and worthy of rule over the lesser creatures of the world, as they had much more power than those creatures, and thus saw themselves as natural rulers. So this resulted in a system where the ancient needs were essentially ruled by the dragons on Edmora, but the dragons didn't really sit on the thrones of the needy kingdom. Rather their wishes and decisions were communicated to the needy kings on Edmora by the dragon priests, mortal men chosen by the dragons to be their mouthpiece in what they saw as a lesser society only meant to be ruled by them. These priests at this time were simply regular humans and their later undead status would only be given to them by Alduin during the later Dragon War, which we'll get to shortly. But these priests at this time were just humans. One of my favorite things to actually imagine is always this scene of one of the Nordic ruins built on mountaintops, like Bleak Falls Barrow for example, where the human dragon priests under the eye of their followers summons the dragons and communicates with them, hearing what their wishes are and bringing their offerings. This system functioned for centuries, with everybody being quite happy with the arrangement as the dragons and humans supposedly had wildly different priorities in life, like the dragons just wanted the respect of being rulers and probably wanted, I don't know, the occasional sheep as a sacrifice or something, while the humans wanted to build cities and such. And as long as they kept worshipping the dragons and sent offerings when asked and didn't really do anything against the dragons and kept themselves to a certain way of life, the humans and the dragons coexisted peacefully and everybody was generally happy with the arrangement as the dragons didn't really want to impact day-to-day -day human life all that much. Now as the needs of Edmora started migrating to Tamriel, many of those who came, especially those who settled in Skyrim, kept their old dragon worshipping ways and some dragons migrated with them. But something happened in Skyrim which greatly upset the balance between the dragons and their human subjects. The dragon priests became corrupted and vied for power. You see, the dragon priests at this time started grabbing more and more power for themselves and in many cases started severely oppressing the people that they ruled, all in name of the dragons who couldn't really care less about how the humans were ruled supposedly. However, most humans weren't too happy with the fact that they were being oppressed so they rebelled and this resulted in the lengthy dragon war, in which the dragon cult, so the ruling dragon priests and those who remained faithful to the priests and the dragons, fought the rebels with the aid of the dragons, as the dragons obviously saw this human rebelling against the dragon priests as an attempt by the humans to deny their domination and supremacy over them. Now, the dragon war was long, and eventually it was won by the rebels after the dragon Parthenex and reportedly some other dragons defected to the rebel side and taught them the tomb, so the voice, giving them access to the dragon shouts. The rebels put down many dragons and slowly but steadily pushed the dragon cult and the oppressive dragon priest back, winning the war definitively when the ancient heroes Gormleth Goldenhild, Hakon One-Eye and Feldir the Old banished Alduin millennia forward in time using an Elder Scroll as the throat of the world, which is something that we can witness in Skyrim. The reason this ended the war definitively was because the dragons could not be permanently killed unless killed by another dragon or a dragonborn. Dragons killed by regular mortals would be incapacitated permanently, but could almost instantly be revived again by their leader, Alduin, who had special powers as being the firstborn dragon. 
So the moment that Alduin was banished, the Dragon Cult knew their days were numbered, as they were outnumbered and their trump card of having the dragons on their side would soon fade, as the dragons would be put down permanently now by the rebels, having no Alduin to revive them. So they devised a plan, they would dig themselves in, waiting for Alduin's return to strike back, whenever that would be. The Dragon Priests had been turned to undead liches by Alduin and they buried themselves in the ancient Nordic ruins and tombs with their followers to await his return and awaken once Alduin returned. Because being undead they could wait those millennia. But in those final weeks or months of the Dragon War we don't know exactly what the timeline was. Essentially after Alduin had been vanquished, while they were preparing themselves to be buried and were probably very busy turning their followers undead as well using the powers that Alduin had granted them, the Dragon Priests made a final preparation for the new war to come once Alduin would return. They sent out parties of the remaining Dragon Cult members to retrieve the dead bodies of the dragons which were killed by the rebels and they buried them in burial mounds far away from society hoping that they would never be found by the now long since victorious rebels which still hunted the Dragon Cult. The locations of these burial mounds were recorded and engraved into a stone a dragon stone, holding the map of the places where the dragon cult buried their slain masters, hoping that Alduin would re revive them once he had returned. This is the dragon stone that we find in Bleakfall's barrow, and the stone has an inscription on the back. Here lie our fallen lords, until power of Alduin restore, probably meaning to say until the power of Alduin brings restoration or something like that. As the remains of the dragon cult armies were finally being defeated and only a fraction of their former power remained, the burying of the dragons stopped and the final burial spots were engraved into the stone. The dragon priests then scattered into their ancient tombs around Skyrim, digging themselves in, waiting for the return of Alduin. And the dragon stone was to be buried and protected by one of their greatest warriors, which is the boss level Draugr that we find at the end of Bleakfoss Barrow. The inscription of his tomb says, here lies the Guardian, Keeper of the Dragonstone, and a force of eternal rage and darkness. Who exactly this warrior was, we don't know. Uh, in the original demo of Skyrim, his body was actually a Dragon Priest, which makes slightly more sense as a Guardian for something so valuable as a map of a Dragon Burial site, but sure. He probably was one of their greatest warriors and stronger than maybe even the Dragon Priest themselves, and really powerful in the tomb. We'll just have to imagine that part. Anyway, now you know what the Dragonstone was and why it's so valuable to Farangar and Delphine in the opening stages of Skyrim. As we can see eventually that Delphine gets a copy of the map by Farangar which we can find in her basement. Which is essentially just the map which is on this stone but then copied onto a piece of paper. Which is of course very nice to have if you want to fight the dragons. And with that behind us, that was the story of the Dragonstone. And before I end this video, allow me to say that I hope to see you again in the next Elder Scrolls lore video. If you enjoyed this one and learned something new, and allow me to thank my top Patreon supporters. Bernardo Binda, Gabriel Binda, Polarized Poutine, Athena Iotis, Andrew Jordan, Doji, Fenrir, Sword of Bushido, Sarah Michael and Mr. Christmas. It's thanks to all these people and all the others on screen that this channel stays alive. And for that I am very grateful. That said, a really short word. Um, I might sound a bit tired during this video. I had a pretty bad case of the, well, the whole virus which is uh, going on around the world. And um, yeah, I had a week where I couldn't really do much. The original video for this weekend is um, not really presentable, but I found this old script. <laughs> well, found is a, is a weird word, but I got this old script which I never ended up recording. And I put it out as a video for today since it's slightly easier in terms of footage to record. And uh, since it was already alright. Uh, I don't really know why I never ended up recording it. Anyway, hope to see you again next week when uh, the original video is supposed to air. And uh, that's it. I hope to see you then. Bye-bye.